Christ, I fled for rest. He made to roam and leave for succor of his rest. Till he conduct me home. We'll work till Jesus comes. Till Jesus comes, we'll work. I sought at once my Savior's side, no more my steps shall roam. With him I'll break that chilling tide and reach my heavenly home. Well, work till Jesus comes to work, till Jesus comes will work. Stand, turn to page 143. <clears throat> page 143, stand as we sing. <clears throat> page 143. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Purchase of God, of His Spirit, washing His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. All the day long, perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture, now press on my side, angels descending, praying from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love, this is my story. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Last verse. It's perfect submission. All is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, here with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. You may be seated. Amen. Please. Praise God. Brooks, tonight we're going to finish up in chapter 4 of the book of James. Amen. We have been doing an extensive study on the book of James for some time now. And as rich as it is, and as some things that, brother, uh, thank you, brother, that Brother Willis was alluding to in the Sunday school morning for the Sunday school adult class, as again, that James was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things I want to make mention to you is this. Of all the ways that atheists and agnostics will try their best to thwart the living word of God, one of the things they have an unanswerable question for, one of the things they cannot give an answer for, is how in the world the half-brother of James would have converted his life from going this direction to following his half-brother throughout the entire reading of the book of James, not one time will you ever find the half-brother of Jesus Christ referring to Jesus as his brother. 
Why? James chapter 1. The book of James. So rich. This book is so much to tell. Thank God for a half-brother of Jesus Christ who desired to give his life unto the Lord after recognizing this inevitable truth that Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the grave, and resurrected again. Having understood and noticing the truth of that fact, he converted his life and gave his heart to his half-brother as his Lord and his Savior. You know what he said? That wasn't my brother. He said that was my Lord and my God. That is a tremendous act of humility on this man's behalf. And I know that because the first thing that James says in chapter 1, verse 1, James, a servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. Look what James says. A servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, this man Jesus is now my Lord, and I am but a humble servant. There are many verses inside the book of James which rallies around five particular chapters according to the way that those divisions of that book have been given. But in those five chapters, much can be said about what James has to write. And we could take just about any of those verses and wrap a whole study around them. And I mean, I'm talking a long time. But one of the things that God has led me in this particular study is to look at James chapter 1, verse 22 through 24. And the reason we've looked at this is to wrap our entire study around James around these particular verses. Why? Because I believe what James is trying to edify among the tribes of Israel, speaking directly to the Jews. He says, of all things, this is most important, that you not just be hearers of God's word. What good would it do if you went into your training for your job and they said, we're going to hire you. We'll pay you $100,000 a year. And we're going to give you the most extensive four-week training that you've ever received. Every question you have will be answered. We'll give you all the tools that are necessary for an effective start of this job. And our expectation is by the time you reach the field and you begin to labor, you're prepared to get to work. And you go and you clear those four weeks at the top of your class. And on day one, you fail to pick up the first pen or pencil. You don't type the first email. You don't take the first phone call. I'm telling you, the individual that hired you is going to walk in and say, do you have any plans to work? And you say, no, ma'am, no, sir, I do not. Guess what? You're fired. You see, the Bible's clear here. James is wrapping this study, and he's emphasizing this particular and very important fact. Do not just be hearers of God's Word. And there's a reason for this, because the question is, why can't I just come into church and be a hearer? Can I not just not do what I want to do? I enjoy listening to the Word of God, but it bewilders me, and it's hard for me to go out to the general public because I'm not somebody that is very extrinsic. I don't have the ability to communicate. I don't necessarily like people. And folks, I'm telling you, there are some people that are hard to like. Don't believe me? Stick around at Good Baptist Church for a while. You'll find a few. But the purpose of this is, is James says, listen, it doesn't matter. Because if you only hear the Word of God and you never become a product of the Word of God, you're likened unto something. And look what he says in verse 22. I want all of us to read this together. Here it is. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Folks, brethren, friends, this is a tremendous warning. For this particular reason, I can only give one, one I, uh, personal thought to this or an experience that I've had. I've never really met someone in their right mind who's forgotten who they were. But I have met somebody who, of age, and at that time where their mind begins to slip, I was having a conversation with this gentleman, a man of God one time, and he knew who I was. He knew where we were, Michelle. He knew who he was. And within an instant, he forgot who he was, who I was, or where he was. He had no idea. I've never seen somebody more frightened in all my life. If you've ever driven in a car and gotten completely lost, and I mean you have utterly no idea where you're going, you've never truly been frightened. Brother Hayes has shared a testimony on many of occasions where he was driving one night, and he said, out of nowhere, I had no idea where I was. He said it was the most helpless and most frightening feeling I've ever experienced. But the Bible says this. If you come into God's house and you hear the word and it affects you 
and you go out and you don't become a product or a doer of the word, the Bible says you're like unto a man that beholds his natural face in a glass. And the second, the second you turn around and leave, you forget altogether what manner of man you were. You've forgotten altogether. You are that frightful and fearful man that from one second he knew all, and the next you had no idea who you were, where you were, or who you were talking to. That's a frightening feeling to consider, you all. And I'm going to raise my hand because on many of occasions I have failed my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in not doing what he's asked me to do. But you know what you do with that? I'll tell you what you do. You go to him in humbleness. You ask for forgiveness, and you say, Lord, help me on my next occasion and give me strength to do what you asked me to do. And that's the importance of it, folks. But here's what it is. You need to become a doer of God's word. If you've never witnessed to somebody, if you've never shared the gospel, if you've never picked this up on your own outside of a good preaching church and looked at the word of God, read it and studied it for yourself, the Bible says that when the change happens on the inside and Jesus Christ comes in, do you know what happens? There's a manifestation of the things going on on the outside. And that's the truth. This is the manifestation which James beholds. We've looked at several things all the way through chapter number four. And we looked through verse, I guess it was about verse 5 through verse 12 last week, last Sunday night. And the last thing that we said is it says, humble yourselves, this is verse 10 in chapter 4. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. I can tell you on many occasions I've seen men and women both fall in pride. Pride brings contention, saith the word of God. God hates pride so much that if you build yourself up in a prideful nature thinking that you're something as it was preached this morning, you come to find out that you're not. You know the Bible in the book of Acts says, in him and through him we have all of our being. Our movement and our being comes from God. Everything that we do and everything that we're capable of doing comes from God. And somebody says, but I don't need God. Well, you try to convince yourself and everyone else of that now, but you can't convince God of that when you're at the judgment seat. Do your very best if you'd like but you can't convince him because I can tell you, you do need him. And I know a lot of people that have built pride in their hearts and they're utterly and absolutely miserable. Why? Because they are absent of the one thing that's most needed, a relationship with the creator, the God almighty, the great I am, the one who gives your breath of life. James goes on and says in verse number 11, speak not evil one of another brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law. And judges the law. That is the, Jew, the Jewish law. Amen. That is the law which Moses gave to the Jewish people which he received of God. Now look what it goes on and says. He says, but if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? And somebody in here is going to say, oh, I see, so we're not to judge one another. No, that's not what the Bible is saying here, and it's very clear. I read to you last week in a particular part of Scripture where Jesus asks a man a question. He says, Simon, this is a Pharisee. He says, let me ask you a question. One man had a debt. Two men had a debt owed uh, to a debtor. One owed 50 pence and the other 500. He frankly forgave them both. Which one do you think will love the debtor more? And Simon said, I perceive that it would be the one that owed the more debt. And he says, thou hast rightly judged. You see, God requires you to give a righteous judgment. And somebody says, well, what about that verse in the book of Matthew? It says, judge not that ye be judged. Well, you've got to continue to read that scripture there because here's what it says. It says, you've got to remove the beam from your own eye before you can start plucking out the, the motes of your brother eye. Look, what the Bible's saying is you're trying to pull out toothpicks everybody else's eyes around you and you've got a two by four stuck in your face. You cannot properly nor righteously judge and help your neighbor along until you get yourself right first. Somebody says, I don't believe that. Who here has flown on a plane before? Anybody flown on a plane? You know, I never really paid attention much to the things that were being said by the flight attendants before takeoff. But one of the things that they say when they're coaching all the individuals who've purchased their ticket and are getting ready to take off at 600 miles an hour and 220,000 feet in the air, that's a scary thought, ain't it? Amen. But you start taking off and they begin to say things about your seatbelt and the airbags and all this. And one of the things I noticed the last time I was on a plane was this. They said, listen, if the airbags deploy and the oxygen levels are low and you've got children, you've got to first put your mask on and then put your children's mask on. Now, that doesn't make much sense when you think about it. Our reaction is as parents is to think, no, I'm going to secure my children first. But you've got to think logically about this. Here's why they say it. If you pass out in the attempt to try and take care of your kids and you miss that opportunity altogether, there's no hope for them because the person behind them is not going to do it. 
and the person in front of them is not going to do it. You know what you got to do? You got to secure yourself first and then you can help others. So you know what happens here? The Bible says if you're going to help your brother along in righteous judgment, what is righteous judgment? According to the law of God, you don't judge the law, but you are a help in the judge of that which law we've been given by the lawgiver to help your brother or sister along. And every one of us can do that in aid. Amen. And we concluded with those particular scriptures, but we're going to go on now because we've got five or six scriptures that we're going to read to finish up Matthew 4. Verse 13 says this, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? Even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. Let's pray. My heavenly Father, we love thee. I thank thee, Lord, for the blessing of the scriptures. And Father, I thank you for the great teaching of the brevity of life. One thing that no man has an answer for that troubles the heart of everyone who lives. When am I going to die? What will that look like? Will it be painful? What's beyond the bridge of death? And Father, I pray that in all things we are reminded by the scriptures that we are running out of time. None of us know the hour in which is called unto our appointed time of death. But Father, the Bible teaches us explicitly that we need to understand how fast and how quick this life truly is and that with what limited time we have, we must yield ourselves and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who died for the sins of the world. I pray, Father, for this hour that thou would bless it, lead me by the inspiration of the Spirit of God and lay my flesh aside that in all things I may exalt the Word of God which was written according to the Scriptures as Peter wrote that holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I thank thee, the author of this book, the Holy Ghost, Father, and for the giving of this word. For the Bible says thy word is truth, and I thank you for such truth in a day of relativism. We ask in all things you watch over us and be with us and forgive me of my sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, for his sake, amen. The Bible begins here in verse 13, and it says, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow. Look at what it says. We will go into such a city and continue there for a year, buy, sell, and get gain. This is the planning of humankind. I know people that literally cannot begin the new year until they've got the entire year planned out. And they'll get on Facebook and social media and talk about all the things that they're going to accomplish in this new year. And that's not a bad idea to plan, don't get me wrong. But when you got everything philosophically planned out, and you've got everything with your family planned out, and you've got everything with your, with your finances planned out, and yet you've not planned for the one thing that's most important, that's the passing from this life unto the life eternal. What good is it? What good is that? That's not being a product of the doer. Listen, I don't have a good 401k. I don't have a big Roth IRA. If somebody wanted to sue me today, it's like squeezing blood from a turnip. I ain't got much. And you know what? You can have what I've got anyway because it all came from Jesus Christ. And if he doesn't want me to have it, I'll go to the streets and preach there. It makes no difference to me. You see, you need to be content with this and this alone that Jesus is in your heart. Because until then, you can't really plan much. But too often we find ourselves saying, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we're going to go and we're going to get much gain. The world has much to offer. We're going to get up and go and sell and make lots of money. And we're going to bring as many people as we can with us. And we're going to work as hard as we possibly can and give utterly no thought to the idea that this life is so brief. I'll tell you, there are people in this room right now that if they could stand up, they would tell you how quick life is. Had a man that was dying in the hospital one time and he looked at me and he says, it is as if the, li the pages of my life are passing by years in a matter of instances. He says, it amazes me how it seems like just yesterday I was a small boy up north with all my friends on Christmas morning and here I am, an old aged and dying man. Life is quick. I've seen young people die, I've seen children die, and I've seen old people die. And the one thing that it all has in common is this, it is brief. This life is but a window. It's a small season. You have utterly no idea when the appointed time of your death is. The Bible tells us that each and every one of us are going to die. It's appointed once for man to die, saith the word of God. And you know, of all the things that people can't seem to agree on in the word of God, they've never been to church, they've never listened to a good sermon, they've never confessed Jesus Christ as their Savior, and then will stand in public and say, I don't agree with one thing the Bible has to say. Here's one, it's appointed once for man to die, amen? You can at least agree with that. That's the truth. There's an absolute truth to that. Now, there is this little thing inside the word of God called the rapture, amen? And let me express something to you. 
If Jesus does come back in my lifetime, and in the twinkling of an eye, I'm transformed and taken in that rapture, and I don't have to taste of death, I'm going to declare this at this very moment. I do not deserve it. I do not deserve it. My sins in my life deserve the death by the cross, but in mercy and grace and love, Jesus Christ took my place. I'll never understand that, but I accept it, amen. Jesus Christ took my death. If they were to drag me through the streets, I would say, even if but to die for the name of Jesus Christ, what pain that I must endure, I endure for the cause of death in him. There is something sincere about loving Jesus Christ because I don't think that you can truly understand how brief life is until you have him. I really don't. Teenagers nowadays and our young people have this idea that they're just going to live forever. They don't give a second thought. I mean, that's why the military are recruiting young men. Why? They're not really thinking about death. It's not something they give much of an attention to. There is a situation in some homes, not all, but they're manipulated and they go in and they think that they're going to live forever. And the truth of the matter is, is that you're not. It would amaze you. And there are so many movies that Hollywood puts out nowadays trying to depict someone that can tell you exactly when you're going to die. And I can tell you if God reached down right now and gave you the exact hour, the exact time, the exact day, and exactly how you're going to die, from this moment on, your life would never be the same. And some of you would be shocked to find that death is right around the corner. It is that close. Somebody says, no, I don't believe that. Well, for those of you that are visiting tonight, there was a young girl recently that was visiting this church. This was just a few months ago. And she had a young man that was coming with her. And she sat back for several months inconsistently coming to church. But I could tell the, the Word of God and Jesus Christ, the truth that the light of Jesus Christ and the preaching of God's Word was dealing with her. And her and this young boy would sit back there in the very backside of church. And one day he walked up and took a Bible for himself and sat and listened to everything that was being preached. And one day, one of the last times she was ever here, she finally came forward broken, heartbroken, tears running down her face, all by herself up here. And one young lady from the church stepped out and went up and began to talk to her. And I knelt down and spoke with her. And she was broken. Her life was tragic. And she finally said, I feel something. I don't know what to do. I said, I can help you if you'd like. She said, please. And at that moment, we led her to the Lord Jesus Christ. And she stood up and confessed Jesus before all people. It wasn't but just a month and a half later that that young man that had been coming to church with her murdered her. She was that close. That close. Now, I have no idea how close that you are. And that broke my heart to hear it. But thank God what a rejoicing that I had knowing that that young lady got her life right. And she did it with the brevity of life in her hands. You have no idea how close it is. And I have some scripture I want to share with you on this. Do me a favor, if you will. Go to Proverbs 27.1. I want you to keep your finger in the book of James. We'll be coming back to it. But in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what day may bring forth. You see, you can make all the plans that you'd like, and I don't think there's anything wrong with making plans, but the one thing you need to plan for is where your soul lies. I know people that will spend months, I mean, I'm prob some people an entire year planning a vacation that only lasts about a week, but they got a year's worth of preparation in that thing, and by the time you get to the vacation, everywhere you go, they say, we're going to be here at 1 o'clock and here at 2 o'clock and here at 3.30. I got reservations here. I got tickets for this dinner over here. We're going to have a blast. And in a week, it's over. But they won't spend 15 minutes thinking about where they're going to spend eternity. I want you to think about that. Not 15 minutes on where they're going to spend eternity because the truth of the matter is we're all going to have to face it one way or another. I didn't get to it today, but in the book of Revelation in chapter 20, just past verse number 10, the Bible says that the sea gave up to the dead and all the inhabitants thereof were brought up before the judgment seat. That's the white throne. You know what the Bible says? They were all judged together. I want you to think about this. In 70 years, this room, just maybe, there may be some young people that are still alive, but if 70 years transpires from this moment, the majority of us are going to be dead. We're going to be dead, and our bodies are going to lay in the grave. And at some point in time in the existence of eternity, in God's perfect will, we're all going to be brought forth before a judgment. I will stand equally with you under the grace and all might of God himself, and we're going to be judged according to our deeds, says the word of God. I won't stand above you. I won't stand beneath you. We'll all stand beneath God, for he is holy, 
holy, holy, and he'll judge us all. And the question is going to be, who did you receive? Satan's lies, as we talked about that deceit this morning, or the truth, which is Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, the terror in the hearts of many that will be there, ah, the terror will be whether or not you truly have Jesus Christ. I have another scripture I want you to read, if you will. Go to Luke chapter 12 and verse number 16, the book of Luke, Luke's gospel. This is Luke's first-hand account of his experiences with the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry. Luke chapter 12 and verse 16, it talks about the parable of the rich fool. Now, this is Jesus Christ in his own words. He says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to, be slow, to, where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. He says, I'm going to pull down all the barns that I've got. I don't have enough room. I'm going to pull them down, and I'm going to build bigger ones. Boy, it's going to be awesome. The plans that I'm making for the future. Look what he says. He says, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool. And do you know why God calls this man a fool? Do you know why Jesus uses that word? In Psalms, I believe it's the 14th chapter, or the 14th Psalm, it says this. Only a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's what a fool says. But you've said it in your heart, there cannot be a God. How can there be a God if all the bad things and all these things in this world happen? I don't want to live under the commandments of an almighty God. I want to live my own life. You can rebel and choose to live whatever life that you choose. But when you choose that, there's going to come a day where you have to give an answer of all those things. Every one of us will have to give an account of all the things we've done. He goes on and says this, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? I want you to recognize what, what God is saying here. He says, You're a fool. All the things you've just stored up this night, who's they going to be? You know if something tragic happened to me and my family, within a matter of months, people are going to come into my house and auction off everything I've got. And some other beautiful family is going to come and move in there and make a an habitation. And they're going to live a life. And this church will move on. Praise God by His will. He'll supply another pastor. But life will go on. But everything that I own will be dispersed. It'll all be gone. You know, I've never seen a funeral being followed by a U-Haul truck. I've never seen such. But I can tell you something. You can lay ahead and store all the things for heaven. You have an opportunity to work for some things, and you could put that U-Haul ahead of that. And it may not be visible to the eyes of those that are trailing behind in sorrow with hearts, missing you because you're missed. And I, I want to say this, too, for those of you that are saved. Listen here very quickly. There's going to be two ways that we look at you when you're gone. The brethren are either going to be relieved or they're going to be grieved. I want you to think about that. You're either going to be grieved in your heart or we're going to be relieved. Now, which, which side are you on? Amen. Because I tell you, for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not saying I want all of you to cry because that's my day of birth. Amen. I'm going to be given a new body in heaven with him. It's going to be a blessing. I'm looking forward to it. The Bible says it is precious of the death of his saints for those that believe. There is a preciousness to it. I heard recently, and some of you may know this man, Brother Lathan Moore reached out to me. And his father, a preacher for many, many years. What was his father's name? Uh, Verdy Moore. Moore. That's right. Brother Bruce Coulter used to talk about that man all the time. But Verdy Moore preached for 60-some years, did he not? Faithful man. And Lathan had called me earlier this week, and he told me, he said, you know, around 3 o'clock in the morning of the day that my father died, you see there was an appointed hour there, he said that he began to say something. And he said, as we leaned in closer to examine the things that my father was whispering under some of his last breaths, we heard this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but ever have everlasting life. Amen. And he said, you know what followed that? He said, for hours upon hours, he said, my father sat there and said, I believe, I believe, I believe. You see, too often nowadays, the elderly and those that are passing on are so drugged up, we don't get their last thoughts any longer. We're missing the opportunity to hear some of the last words of wisdom of those that we loved. But that moment when that man realized that his time was coming, it was slow. It was, death was slowly creeping in on him. And God was going to come and take his soul to be with Jesus Christ forever. Underneath of his breath, his children could hear the man of God saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. One of the things that I love about C.H. Spurgeon is that where he would preach, 
there in Europe, there'd be a time when he would have to walk up this flight of stairs, it was a circular stairs, up to this spot where he would preach. And he didn't do it because he wanted to lift himself up among men and make them look like something. He had thousands of people that would come to hear him preach. And acoustically, the best way to reach all the individuals in that room, and he didn't have the technology that we have today to exemplify a voice under the thousands of people that can gather, you had to get at a high point and that your voice would then carry. And as he was walking up those stairs, a man watched him one day because it took him some time to get up the, the, to, the stop, the, to the top there of where he would preach. And he would stop and say something at each stair. And a man finally got wise and asked him, he said, Spurgeon, what are you saying? And I'm not, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to, but I'm just curious what it is that you're uttering under your breath. And Spurgeon, as he would take one step, he said, I believe in the power of the Spirit of God. I believe in the power of the Spirit of God. You see, there's something about the thoughts of those that love the Lord Jesus Christ and the belief that we carry in all things according to this scripture. And if you believe all things, you've got to believe this. You've got to get your heart right with Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the only thing that's going to matter in your hour of judgment is whether or not you've taken him or you haven't. I've preached for 20 minutes. I've got 25 more to go. Back in the book of James. Amen. Back in the book of James. The Bible says this, whereas you know not for what, what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while, a little time, and then it vanisheth away. It's here, and then it's gone, you all. I tell you, when you look at the life as a vapor, I, I believe what the Spirit of God is writing here through, the, through James is a literal vapor of your life. And I'm going to read to you Job 7.7. 7. If you'd like to turn there, that's no problem. But I'm going to jump back here in the book of Job. This is the oldest book in all the Bible. And Job writes something in all of his wisdom that I think is very valuable to those that are here tonight. Job 7.7 7 says, Oh, remember that my life is wind. It's here one second and gone the next. The Bible says that your life is like a vapor. It's like a wind. It's like a tale that's told. It is here one second, and then without another thought, it is gone. It is so short. And I can tell you that people, when they die naturally, they express to you several things either all the regrets of their life and the things that they would have changed. And boy, how sad is it that people have to be so regretful of all the things they've ever done. I know a lot of people right now that I love dearly, but if death were to slowly come upon them, they are going to be in great regret of the life that they lived. And that's the truth. But you know the beauty of it? You know the beauty of it is? Is that even in that last moment, having rejected Jesus Christ and lived the, the wicked and most sinful cursed life that you can consider, the Bible says in that moment they can take the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they didn't prepare that you haul ahead, amen, but they can still take Jesus Christ for their own. Back in the book of James, if you will. If you're already in Job, that's fine, or if you were in Job, let's just turn back to the book of James. I want to look at one more verse concerning a vapor because Peter in chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 24, Peter recognizes something here. He says, for all flesh is as a grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Look in verse 25. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Amen. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Thousands of years men have died reading this book and hearing it preached. I, I refer to Benjamin Franklin several times because I do enjoy the history of America, and he was an interesting fellow. But I believe it was George Whitfield that he would go and listen to preaching, and he would hail George Whitfield as the greatest preacher of all. But you know what's sad? As smart as that man was, it is never revealed to us in history that he ever accepted what George Whitfield was preaching. He loved it, he respected it, but he never accepted it. Why? I believe that an intellectual man has a difficult time coming to the truth of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we have to create reason within our minds. And I tell you, no matter how much you read of this and how much you hear this preached, you cannot give all reason to everything that's in here. Our finite minds cannot understand everything that's here. Why is that? I'll tell you, because this book was written supernaturally. Amen. It was written in a way that no other man has ever written any other words. And it has lasted the test of time. For the last 2,000 years, skeptics have raged upon this book. They have ridiculed this book. Satan has come across and tried to destroy this book. It has outlived all of its authors by thousands of years. You know, the, some of the oldest books in, a, in some of these Harvard professors' libraries range around 200 years. And there was a man that was asked one time, he says, is it, is it pretty natural for a book to outlive its author by 200 years? 
And that Harvard professor said it is, it is very rare that an author, a book would outlive its author by 200 years. Here we are 2,000 years later, and this book is still the number one most sold book in all of the entire world. Amen. This book right here has outlived everything. Why? Because it's either just a bunch of fables and men just love getting together and talking about some guy that died on the cross that wasn't real, or everything about this book is the absolute and utter truth. Amen. And it is what liberates the souls of men. I believe it with all my heart. James says this as we go on here in verse 15. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I want to close with a couple of, of things here regarding these last three scriptures. Verse 15 says, for, if you ought to, for that you ought to say that the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Somebody asked me one time, they said, you know, usually when you make a comment, Brother Joe, you say, Lord willing, Lord willing. Hey, I'll see you tonight, Lord willing. Why is that? Because if God wills me to be here in the presence of the house of God, that is God's will, amen. That means that I am committing to you verbally, I am subject under what God's will is. You know what that also says? That if I'm not to return tonight, praise God, it wasn't his will. That's, that is surrender, folks. That's not commitment. That's surrender. And somebody says, what's the difference? There's a massive difference. In Western American culture, the word surrender has been replaced in preaching with commitment. Somebody says, I'm going to make a commitment to God. God's not looking for your commitment. Did you know that when somebody says, God, if you'll heal this, this friend or this mother or this sick father that I have, I'll do everything you ask me to. And the second they receive an answer of that prayer... Guess what? They go off and never commit themselves to what they said they were going to do. Here's the other part of that. You own your commitment. And if you don't live up to it, oh, it was just a small commitment. God's not looking for commitment. He's looking for absolute and total surrender. Amen. In the acts of war, when one gets an advantage of the other, and the enemy comes and they have the allies there laid on their knees, and they go by and they're asking for full surrender, Audrey, and a man says, I'm not willing to surrender, I'm willing to commit. They're going to be shot probably on sight. The enemy's not looking for commitment. They're looking for your absolute and total surrender. And if that can be the act that we wage in war, how much more should that proceed at the thought of God Almighty? God says, I want you to surrender all. There's an old song we sing in these hymn books, sometimes in the invitation it says, I surrender all. I surrender all. That means, Father, I give it all up. Whatever you ask me to do, I'll do it. I'm not going to make a commitment that tomorrow if I don't have to work, I'm going to come to church. That's not the way that it works. You surrender everything and yield it unto him. Now, how do I know these things to be true? Look at Acts, if you will, the book of Acts 18 and verse 21. Talking about the will of God, Acts 18 and verse 21. This is Paul and some of his traveling here. When we're given this writing here, uh, I believe that the author of the book of Acts was Luke. And he goes on to say this, he says, But bade them farewell, saying, I must, again this is Acts 18, 21, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return unto you again if God will. If God will. You know what Paul is saying here? I've surrendered my life and I've got to go. I desire to be with you here, but I must go here first. But if it's God's will... I will return unto you again. That's a subjection. That's a full surrender. Paul is declaring his surrender to God. Now, 1 Corinthians 4, 19. In the book of 1 Corinthians, in chapter number 4, in the 19th verse. The Bible says, But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power Again, he says, if I come to you, I come by the will of God. If I leave this building tonight, you got to understand this. If I leave this building tonight and God wills it that I die, God's will be done. Amen. Let the will of God run its free course. Amen. I don't like that. I don't like the thought of not being in control of my own life. Do your very best to be in control of your life. I can tell you the debtors are still going to call tomorrow. I can tell you that things aren't going to always go right and be in your favor. Do your very best to control what life that you've got. And the truth of the matter is, and you're going to find this to be an inevitable truth, you're not in control. You are all subject under God's will. 
And what is God's will? Somebody says, how are we to know the will of God? Peter said this, it is not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not God's will that you die. It's God's will that you be saved and accept his will for your life. Because when you can accept his will, you can accept the death by his will. Listen closely back in the book of James as we finish up these last thoughts here. Verse 16 says, but now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. We are not to rejoice in the boastings of our own work. I said this this morning, but I'm going to say it again. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. says, this is by grace through faith are you saved, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, we as a human nature have a desire to boast of the things that we do. He says, all such boastings in your own works are what? Look what it says here. It says it's evil. It's wrong. Don't boast in the things that you can do. Amen. Somebody made mention to me on Friday night after I gave that speech there in Hodgeville. They said, boy, you did a good job. I said, praise God. I'm glad he met me here for it. Amen. I'm glad he met me. If I had been without the presence of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God, I would have been vile by myself. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. I've never feared of preaching to a church with empty pews. I've always feared of preaching from a pulpit with an empty spirit. For without that, I'm all alone. And there's much trembling to be done there. Lastly, as we finish up, verse 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Luke chapter 12. We're going to look at two more verses as we close tonight. Luke chapter 12 and verse 47. The Bible said, and that Lord, or that servant, which knew, not, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did, did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. Now, this is going to be at some contention for some of you that have heard this because you're, Jesus is speaking. This is the red letters of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, if you know to do good and you don't do it, he says, you're going to be punished for it. Now, one thing you have to understand is the Bible says that he loveth who he chasteneth. Amen. I love my children. That's why I chasten my children. If I didn't love them, I wouldn't do that. And I realize, and my, my kids ask this question all the time, Daddy, I know you spank us because you love us, but how is that? Well, somebody help me explain that to my kids. Some of you wise men in here can help me out there. I've just accepted by faith that if God loves me and he's paying attention to the things that I'm doing and he's holding me accountable, it's because he loves me and he expects much of me. Somebody says, well, I don't like to be expected of much. To whom much is given, much is required. You know, when it talks about you not knowing whether, whether you're doing wrong or if you haven't received the truth, one thing I know is in our judicial system, one man pulls the trigger. Two men are standing by, one's driving the car and one is an accomplice letting him in the front door. The one man that pulled the trigger is going to receive a much higher punishment for having committed the act of murder. The other two were accomplices. And typically in our system, there is a lesser punishment for the two that didn't physically commit that murder. But they were an accomplice to it. Where do we get our, our judicial laws from? I can tell you mainly from the book of Leviticus, amen. That my daughter is trying to out-preach me right now. I think she's doing a pretty good job. But you need to understand that if you believe that a man that murdered another man is, is in, it should in be in the receiving end of a higher punishment, and there's nothing wrong with Jesus Christ here saying that if you knew it, you received the truth, and you still did wrong, there's going to be a punishment for you. I know that David, he knew it was wrong to commit murder. He knew it was wrong to commit adultery. He did it in his heart first, brought Bathsheba in, slept with that woman while her, her husband was out fighting a war, sent her home, and she got pregnant. He brought her husband home, tried to get her husband to go into her to hide his sin. He wouldn't do it. He murdered that man. And then finally, the prophet Nathaniel, I believe, was the one that revealed it to him. He said, listen, David, you've committed a sin. He told him this story about a lamb and how the lamb was slaughtered. And he says, you tell me the man that's committed such, and I'll see to it that he's killed. And he said, it's you, David. It's you. And I tell you that he was sorely punished for that. There was a time when he saw his son Absalom that took over the kingdom at, 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 uh, over his father's reign and he was hung by his hair on a tree. And I tell you that the heart of David wept. Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom. He wept for him. Why? Because his punishment was too great to bear. He didn't blame God. David blamed himself in humility. 
You've got to be humble in your punishment. Take it because you know it. How much sore a punishment think you are worthy, saith the word of God. You being under the blood of Jesus, I say ever the more so. And I think that Christians ought to endure that punishment knowing that you've received the truth. And if you have the truth, you ought not to do the things which are sinful. I don't know where you stand tonight. I don't know where you are in your life. I know that Jesus has brought this message for a particular reason. But one thing I have found out the last two years is some people are in real need of truth. They really are. I've had a lot of people come to me in this ministry, and I mean, it is just, I'm blown away with what God's done the last three years of my life. Never could I have expected such. But I tell you, some people are in real need of truth, and they have come to love this word and to love the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking, I'd like to, but I don't know how. You get to come forward. We're going to give an invitation. Sister, if you come, brother, if you come, you're going to have an opportunity to take all the things that were preached, and you can confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior tonight. Amen. I want everybody to stand to their feet real quick. I want you to turn to page 293, and I'm going to pray, close our service out, and give an invitation. We'll sing a verse or two. If nobody comes, we'll conclude our service tonight. Page 293, my Heavenly Father, we love Thee and thank Thee for the blessing of fellowship. We thank You for the gathering of the saints here this evening, Father. And we thank You for all those that are guests here tonight, but I pray in all things that You've convicted the hearts of many. I ask that You just continue to lift up those that are in need of being lifted up, Father, be with this church family, protect it and unify it. And I pray in this invitation that if there's one soul without the Lord Jesus Christ here tonight, they'd come and take him for their own. We love and thank you for all that you do. Pray forgive me of my sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, for his sake, amen. Page 293, if God's dealt with you, you come.